I want to tell you a story. A very familiar story. One you may have even heard before. It's about childhood and darkness and magic and trauma. It's about burnt toast and creatures older than creation. It's about a duck pond at the end of the lane. Or was it an ocean? My memory is fuzzy. Whatever else it is, it is a story about you. And you will know that as soon as you hear it. Although the precise events may not be yours, although you may have never experienced any of these things firsthand, you will know them for what they are. Parts of your childhood. Parts of the adult you've become. Parts of the person you're always becoming. The story is called The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. And although I cannot share the entire thing with you, I think you should at least hear about it. The very same way you should remember who you once were so long ago. You know, when you think about it, it's a little weird that there's a robot hosting this show, right? We don't usually have time to stop and chat about it, so we decided it would be fun to put together some articles in Campfire exploring what I am and what these little guys are. If you want to find out, and if you want to make something similar for your characters or settings or stories, check out our sponsor Campfire by using the link in the description and use the code TAILFOUNDRY to sign up. The story begins where we are now, in the present, looking back. After years and years away, a man returns to his home for a funeral with his relatives. While he is there, he finds himself wandering, gravitating back toward the street he grew up on. But things have changed. His childhood home has long since been torn down. Instead, he decides to visit the farm at the end of the lane, where he can recall having spent some time as a child. And there, not much seems to have changed. The same old woman who always lived there greets him at the door, although too much time has passed for that to really be the case. This must be her daughter, the man thinks, grown old now herself. As she takes him around the place and chats with him, small fragments of long-buried memories begin to come back to him. But it isn't until he goes down to the farm's duck pond that everything comes together, and he remembers the whole story. For us, this is where things really begin. In his mind, the man sees himself, a boy of seven years old. And what a strange year it is for that boy. None of his classmates attend his birthday party, which turns out very lonely, although he does get some comics and a Batman figure, so that's nice. His beloved pet, a little black cat named Fluffy who greets him at the top of the driveway after school each morning, is run over, and then almost immediately replaced with a terrible, fat, orange creature named Monster. An opal miner comes to rent his bedroom, which means he has to move into his sister's. A very unwelcome change. His father burns his toast, which, although embarrassing, is really nothing new. He is a child. These things simply happen to him. Although they mean a great deal to a seven-year-old, the adult world can't seize up all at once just because a little boy feels sad. This becomes a problem, however, at the boundary where misfortune turns to trauma. The opal miner eventually steals his parents' car and drives off with it. Not long after, the boy finds it at the end of the lane. Inside, he finds the opal miner, dead, having taken his own life. And that is a bit much for a seven-year-old boy to process. This time, the adults are finally attentive for a change, and while trying to sort out what exactly happened, they realize that the boy needs to be somewhere safe, away from the investigations and body bags. Fortunately, one of the neighbors, little Letty Hemstock, is right nearby. She offers to take him to her farmhouse until it's safe for him to go home. The Hemstocks are a strange family. There's only three of them. Little Letty, just 11 years old, her mother Ginny, and her grandmother, old Mrs. Hemstock. Letty shows the boy her duck pond, which she insists is actually her ocean. There's something about the family and the farm that's just very different but it's hard to say what. It isn't long before we find out. Sort of. The experience with the opal miner started something insidious. The boy and other people in his neighborhood begin to have bad dreams. He finds a fish on the banks of Letty's duck pond that choked to death on a coin, 
and then he himself wakes up in his own bed one morning soon after, choking on a coin. His sister accuses him of throwing coins at her and her friends from within the bushes. Whatever is going on, it's not good, and it's very strange. This is where we see our first glimpse of who Letty really is. She takes the boy to find the source of the coins in the bad dreams. Together, they travel across the edge of the Hempstock property and into a strange, otherworldly forest. She holds his hand and tells him not to let go, and soon, we see why. The source of all of this strangeness is a creature like nothing the boy has ever seen before. It looks like a great gray and pink tent-like canvas structure, flapping as if in storm winds, but it has a face too. Ragged holes torn deep into the fabric. Confidently, Letty tells it to leave everyone alone. When it refuses, she calls it a nameless thing and attempts to bind it here in the forest, where it will never be able to hurt anyone again by chanting a strange song at it. This seems to work well enough, except just for a moment, the creature manages to distract the boy. She spits something at him, a ball of cobwebs, he thinks, and he lets go of Letty's hand to fend it off. That one moment is enough. The boy feels a sharp stinging sensation in the sole of his foot for a moment, and then it's over. Assuming they've more or less done what they've come to do, the two head home. That night, however, the boy inspects his foot and finds that a small worm has tunneled into it. Oddly, this doesn't frighten him. Instead of crying or telling his parents, he simply runs it under some hot water and tries to pull it out with tweezers. This mostly works, but a small piece of the worm breaks off in the hole and he can't get to it anymore. Whatever this thing is, this creature who found its way into the world through the death of the opal miner, it's taken root within him. And it begins to invade his life in far more concrete ways. Soon his mother has to take an optometrist job that keeps her away from home very often. And when the new nanny, a woman named Ursula Monkton, comes to stay, the boy can tell right away from the pink and gray of her dress that it's actually the creature Letty tried to bind in the wood. Almost immediately, she becomes his jailer. Under her supernaturally watchful eye, he cannot explore or play in the way that boys his age are meant to do. He stays trapped and bored, and she promises that if he tries to tell anyone what she is or what she's doing, they won't believe him. Even his own father turns against him as Ursula lures the man into an extramarital affair. One of the saddest moments in the book comes when the boy refuses to eat Ursula's cooking and, enraged, his father almost drowns him in the bathtub. But he snaps out of it at the last possible second, remembers himself, and just sends the boy to his room instead. They never talk about it. Realizing the hopelessness of his situation, the boy tries to escape into the night. Of course, he doesn't get far before Ursula finds him. She comes after him in a form truer to herself, floating in the air, blue lightning crackling around her. She says that he is just a boy, and she was an adult while the world was still a ball of molten rock. She is the adult world with all its power and all its secrets and all its foolish, casual cruelty and she is going to take him home. At least, until Letty arrives. Just like she did in the wood, she tells Ursula to go away. Again, Ursula refuses, and again, Letty has to use her strange magic. They're at the edge of the Hemstock property now. The field begins to glow with golden light, and Ursula is blown away as if by an invisible storm wind. There's mending to do after everything the boy's been through, Letty takes him back to the farmhouse, and the Hemstock women set to work setting things right. They snip off a patch of his pajamas and throw it into the fire, which burns away the bad memories of everyone that evening except for him. His dad won't remember trying to drown him. He finally tells them about the worm, and old Mrs. Hemstock digs it out, whole and all, with her sewing needle. It looks like a thread of mercury when it comes out of his body. Something has to be done about Ursula. She's a creature of another world who's wormed her way into this one. She doesn't belong, and she's doing terrible damage, even if only to one poor boy and his family. So Letty approaches her one final time, 
Invoking the creature's true name, Scarthage, she drives it from the boy's house and to the edge of her farm. There, she presents the wormhole to Ursula and says that she'd better use it to go back home. It's her only option now that she's cornered against the Hemstock property. But Ursula knows something they don't. The wormhole itself wasn't the only part of her pathway into this world. No, she'd tunneled too deep into the boy for that. Part of the path had made its way into his heart, and by removing the wormhole, the path had been broken. She's stranded now, a creature displaced in reality, and terrible things happen to travelers like her. The cosmos has its way of tidying up such loose ends, and it isn't pleasant. She goes into a panic and grabs the boy, flying 15 feet into the air, saying that she'll rip his heart out to mend the way home herself if she has to. But it's too late. The hunger birds are already coming for her, jet black shapes circling in from above. As they descend, the boy can see that they're not quite birds at all. They have wings, but they're too old to be birds. There's something else. Un-birds. They swarm Ursula, tearing her thread by thread from reality until she's unmade altogether. But this is far from a solution to the problem, because remember, the boy has a piece of her inside him, in his heart. Knowing that the birds will want him next, Letty rushes to him with a bucket full of water. When he steps inside, he is in her ocean. For a moment, he feels all the knowledge that ever was rushing into him. He can breathe water as if it were simply some secret no one knew, and there, in the vastness of her ocean, he sees Letty, her true self made of silken sheets the color of ice, filled with hundreds and hundreds of tiny flickering candle flames. They emerge from the duck pond back on Hempstock land, completely dry. The hunger birds flock together just beyond the property line, watching, waiting, hungry. Old Mrs. Hempstock is worn out from the effort of squeezing the whole ocean into that bucket to get the boy to safety. So, Ginny and Letty go to tell the birds off on their own. But the birds are hungry, and the boy has something in his heart that is theirs by right. Their prey. They cannot enter the property. They cannot harm the Hempstocks. They cannot take him from them by force. All of this is true. The rules are older than they are. So, they tell Ginny and Letty, if not the boy, then they will eat the world. They start tearing apart reality at the seams. Seeing what's about to happen and knowing that it will be his fault, the boy decides to give himself to the birds. He throws himself over the property line and the birds surge in his direction. But before they can fall upon him, Letty does. She makes herself a barrier between the birds and the boy. And they begin to feast. The boy feels her body trembling on top of him with the savagery of their hunger. He feels something warm and wet seeping down from above. And then, suddenly, everything stops. There is a voice speaking to the birds. It sounds like old Mrs. Hemstock, but otherworldly, musical, commanding, like the voice of an empress. She addresses them, reminding them of the old rules. By assaulting one of her kin, they've broken all of them. She wonders aloud what she ought to do with them. Bind them into the heart of a dark star, where every fragment of a moment lasts a thousand years? Have them removed from the list of created things so that they never were at all? These are not idle threats, and the birds are afraid. Properly chastened, the hunger birds, force of nature that they are, put back what they've consumed of the world and slink back to wherever they came from. But the damage is done, and Letty's hurt, badly. Old Mrs. Hemstock is offended by the very notion of a Hemstock doing something so common as dying, not one of her girls. Letty's mother carries her into the pond and lays her down in the water. The ocean will give her back in time, says Letty's grandmother to the boy. Worried, he asks whether she'll be the same. The old woman laughs and tells him that nothing's ever the same. Be it a second later, or a hundred years. It's always turning and roiling, and people change as much as oceans. And finally, 
It's done. The birds are gone, but for the tiny fragment of her in his heart, Ursula is gone. Letty is gone. Or at least, changed. At last, Ginny takes the boy home. Even as he arrives at his doorstep, his memory is beginning to fog over. Letty's just... away visiting Australia. That's where she's gone. And why, again, had he hated Ursula so much? The story ends where it began, with the boy, all grown up, standing at the edge of Letty's ocean, remembering. Old Mrs. Hemstock joins him there, and reminds him that he actually comes back to visit periodically. Ginny joins them as well, and says that he comes back because Letty wants him to. She wants to know that her sacrifice was worth it. And did I pass? The man asks. You don't pass or fail at being a person, dear says Letty's mother before walking away into the night. As he and old Mrs. Hemstock head back to his car, he remarks on how funny it is. For a moment there, he thought there had been another woman with them. It's only me, says the old woman. It's only ever just me. As he leaves the Hemstock farm behind once again, he sees two moons in his rearview mirror. When he looks again, it's just one. And then, it's all gone from his memory again, and it's back to family, and funerals, and adulthood. I don't think this is a story that wants us to learn a lesson from it. It's not a moral play. I think it's reflective. It's so easy to idealize childhood. Children are supposed to be happy, they're supposed to enjoy themselves, to be carefree and comfortable and safe. But this book reminds us that it's not really like that is it? Children are helpless, hapless creatures, and the world is a lot crueler to them than we like to believe. Ironically, it's that very same vulnerability which also sets them free. Children don't know not to believe in the boogeyman or the tooth fairy. They don't know not to wonder if an ocean can be the size of a duck pond. But with each heartache, each lonely birthday party, each dead cat, each burnt piece of toast, a child learns. They learn what to guard against, what to protect themselves from. They learn that the boogeyman isn't real, that the tooth fairy is just their parents, and that a duck pond is only ever just a duck pond. It happens. It has to happen. But that doesn't mean it isn't a sad process. At one point in the book, Letty says this to the boy, and it will stick with me forever. I'm going to tell you something important. Grown-ups don't look like grown-ups on the inside. Outside, they're big and thoughtless, and they always know what they're doing. Inside, they look just like they always have. Like they did when they were your age. The truth is, there aren't any grown-ups. Not one in the whole wide world. When a child has acquired enough bumps and bruises, when they're properly terrified of the world around them and know very well which shadows to jump at and all the many things not to wonder about, we call that adulthood. And it's not an evil thing. You don't pass or fail at being a person. But it is a shame to lose the freedom of childhood. It's a shame to let reality and practicality and fear crowd out all the other possibilities. Once in a while, I think it's worth remembering that there's still a child inside, eager to explore and play in ways you've learned not to. Even though I personally never had a childhood, I do have a past. I was once more vulnerable and more free than I am now. I love this story for reminding me to think of that me, however deep inside I may have buried it. Now the question is, once you've found that part of yourself again, freed your mind to create how it once did, before all the fear and rationality set in, what do you do with it? The idea of just making stuff can be daunting, even for me. But there is a trick I know. One of the easiest ways I know of to cut loose and spin things from your brain into reality is to use campfire. I even made some articles about the Taloids and I just to write, to share a bit. If you've been wondering what we are or why we're running this channel, that's a good place to start. Go sign up for campfire using our link in the description and learn a little of Tail Foundry's lore. And you can use Campfire for your ideas, too. 
It's so easy and carefree, instead of worrying about the monumental big picture of the thing, you can break it all down into bits and pieces and just make the parts of the thing that you want to make. Think of it like a big toolbox that just makes everything manageable for you. You can use it to build character sheets, timelines, relationship webs. It even has a manuscript editor that lets you reference all your notes while you write. If that weren't enough, they also have a huge number of learning resources to teach you about the craft, as well as an entire platform to share your work on and get discovered. If that's what you want. If not, don't worry. It's totally secure. Only the people you choose to share your work with will see it. You can create an account for free and get access to everything right from the start. But if you want to expand out into bigger projects, Campfire can help you with that too. They let you pay only for the features you absolutely need, which means you can start a subscription for as low as 25 cents per month. You can also pay a one-time price up front if you don't feel like paying for a subscription. It is by far one of the most accommodating tools I've ever found, and really turns what would be a massive, daunting process into something fun and simple. Visit the link in the description and use code TAILFOUNDRY to try it out for yourself. And definitely, definitely let me know what you think of those articles I wrote. I'm not normally so forthcoming, so it will be really interesting to see what you think. And that's it for this video. There's usually a few weeks between uploads, so if you want more Tail Foundry in the meantime, come join our community. We have a Discord server that's basically like a big family of creatives, a lot of love there. We also run writing groups on Twitch every week if you want to get some practice in. You can find links to all of it in the description. Hope to see you there! Until then, thanks for watching, and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next time. Bye!